But yeah, we're just going to open up in prayer as uh, they've heard that tonight we're going to be talking about genocide in the Bible, most likely in the new, uh, I mean, Old Testament is where it talks about those. And for those who actually have gone out, like just like I'm sure for many of us that when we go out and we have those conversations with others or even watch videos of evangelism, We've heard the statement that the Old Testament God calls for mass genocide of people and children. And for some of us as like new Christians who have not yet even dived into reading the Old Testament may find it shocking or hard to believe. But just for those uh, who have read it still might find it difficult addressing such a very sensitive topic. And that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, again, this is laid back. You guys, if you have any questions or anything, this isn't like a sermon. No, I just spout for 30 minutes and then dip out. All right. This is more involved. <laughs> All right. So we'll just open up in prayer and then uh, we'll, we'll dive right into this. Lord in heaven, uh, thank you so much for this wonderful community. Thank you so much for all these gifts you have provided for us. Um, all both in the general sense and the individual basis. I pray that tonight as we uh, dive into this very sensitive topic, which uh, there are many routes we can go to helping understand who you are and why it, what happened in the past and why it was recorded. And it actually paints a better picture of your character. So God, I pray that uh, for those who are actually burning with this question or dealing with this issue, God, I pray we just come in it with an open mind, no emotional biases or ties to anything, but just to understand what does the scripture say and is it wrong or what stance does it come from when addressing these issues? I pray for every each individual here who are so just I'm so passionate for and I love them and I pray that they uh, continue uh, to grow with you as we uh, endure this class. Thank you so much, Lord, in your son's glorious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. Amen. So there are so many multiple routes we can take to answer this question when it comes to why did God allow for mass genocide in the Old Testament? But if you notice a pattern of somebody switching topic or ignoring verses that you show why God used individuals to judge certain societies, that's when you're also supposed to switch tactics as well. We'll get into that a little bit later. But firstly, can I get some examples from you guys or what sort of questions or concerns that could be brought up that can relate to this topic of why do you think God allows for a genocide in the Old Testament? Um, a reason as why our Lord God would allow that is to pass judgment for breaking the Lord's commands. Uh, that, that's actually a good point. Uh, that actually is raised. Good answer, Dorn. Uh, where... God allows for these things is also because God is just. And as we go through this class, we're going to realize we're going to dive into what these societies have been doing. And when historical records and ancient texts show what these cultures have been doing for over many, many years, like over 500 years, they have been doing these horrendous acts. And if somebody still has a problem with like that, you know, we'll, we'll get more into it. And I believe I heard someone says, like, the Lord wills it, which I guess from a Christian point of view, we can understand it. But if you're talking to somebody that has no clue who God is or whatever, for them, they're like hearing the word genocide is automatically tied to evil, like how a person or Hitler or Stalin does mass genocide. So if you say God wills it, then they're just going to paint him, and no offense in the, on the answer, but they're going to paint him as a evil kind no, of no, God. No offense taken. But, yeah, yeah. But in my opinion, when he wills something, it, it, evil is is his, you know, definition, right? That he decides what's what's evil, not us. Well, it flows you, from you his can't character. Explain it like that to someone who's not a Christian, though, because they yeah understand it. Because we we know God, we know, know his we... character, we know that he is just, we know that he's merciful, we know that he's great. What is this pillow? Yeah, and. They don't know what character God. And if you say, oh, that's just what he does, they're going to paint him in a very negative light and not understand that because his character is just and he does not contradict himself because that is who he is, then it's it's consistent and it's objective and it's not going to change. So like we know that, but the individual you could be talking to may have no idea. 
if that makes sense. Okay, yes, fizzy. <laughs> <laughs> One of my thoughts is God also knows the follies of the Israelites. If they allowed even a few of the remnants of these cultures into the Israel, they're going to follow those cultures. Mm. That's also a fair point. So he brings up a good issue by saying because God is outside space and time, like he knows what cause and effect may happen. And for some of us, and this is actually another good argument, is that if God does exist and this God is outside space, time and the cosmos, like he created it with just a single word, he would have a better understanding of the past, present and future. He can see it all in one glance and knows every single choice has what outcome and how his hand can play in that role and what good can come out of a certain outcome. Now, we may not know it just as a, a child, like that's a toddler, may not know why the parents don't allow them to eat ice cream for dinner every single night, even though they think it tastes good, therefore it's good for them. <laughs> but the parent knows a lot better because guess what? Their brains are more developed and they have more experience. So just when it comes to us, our three pound meaty sack of a brain for somebody to say, oh, I could have done this better than the person that knows everything. I, I, I would never have that kind of faith in myself. I'm just going to say, put it at that. <laughs> but yes, Pearly. Um, I would ask, uh, what is the nature of his justice? Like what kind of justice is he enforcing? So because God is good, when we mean by justice and like his righteousness, that, that flows from his character, that is who he is as a being. And when it's, when righteousness means his good is, is obviously the arbor, uh, the objective definition of what good is. That's why his laws are there for us to see how sinful we are, just as it says, I believe in Romans and it helps grasp us how morally perfect he is compared to everything else in the universe and that's why it's so important that people the closer you draw to god as you experience the more sinful you feel because you're getting approached by something that is completely good and no no stain no anything whatsoever and um that's why when he says justice it is a part of his character. Like he cannot let evil because of his character of goodness go unpunished because then you're allowing evil to exist and God cannot allow evil to exist. But all those are just wonderful, wonderful points. And we're, we are going to address every single one of those. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. So firstly, as we give examples, such as uh, you guys asked, and I've stated multiple times, there are many routes we can take while addressing this issue. First, always, always answer that question directly. Therefore, they do like if they do not like that answer, you can always switch up your approach. So don't all, I usually sometimes when someone, let's say you're talking with an atheist and they say, you know, God is evil and stuff. And some people who have actually attended these apologetics class knows that if there is no God, there is no moral objective, like compass, there is no right or wrong. It's all arbitrary. It's all an opinion. So you can always switch it on that, but you're still not answering their question. And they can use that as a foothold to get a grasp on you and saying like, well, you don't know the answer because you're, you're deviating from the topic. And I have experience of, of experiencing that. <laughs> so that's why you always uh, address it first. And if they just, throw the answer off the table and still keep hounding you on it, then you pull out that card because it's more of an emotional tie than it is a logical. Uh, so first question most likely is what they're going to ask is if God is so good and loving, just like you Christians express, then why did he murder people in the old Testament, let alone children, and babies example of Exodus 12, 29 through 30, which it reads, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all of his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was a loud wailing from Egypt. There was not a house without someone dead. So this person can use this argument as a stance of saying, if God is real and he exists then he is evil especially coming from the christian god that claims in the bible again a very important to address this question wider right away 
But before I get an answer, would someone like to try to answer this when when approached with such a question? What about the covenant? Uh, Noah's covenant. Yeah, you're gonna trip somebody. Well, that was God's promise. He says he's not going to do it again. It's not that he regrets. I know there was one passage that in the Old Testament that says that when God created human beings and then rebelled against them and created such evil, he had mm -hmm. such remorse and sorrow that he did create them. But not that he still didn't love them, but he's just realizing because there's so much hurt and pain because, caused from his creation, it hurt him deeply. So it wasn't like a resentment. It was more of just being hurt because of our choices. Are you saying like genocide is like okay sometimes? Like if God commands it, it's okay. Okay, here see that's that's a that's a good question. So we're we're gonna address that here. Mm -hmm. Let me see here. Blah, 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 blah. The first point, there's many ways we can address this, but I'm just gonna go through the whole thickness of it, right? Since God is the creator of everything and life, he has the authority to give it and to take away whenever he sees fit. Now, at some people, they can find offense to this, but I'll give you an example. Let's say you and I were really good friends, and I decide you no. decide to buy you food every Saturday for lunch for the next few months. It's a generous thing to do, and I didn't have to do it. But if I suddenly say, oh, hey, not this time, and stop paying for it, does that make me a bad person? Since I initiated no. the generosity act in the first place, I can stop it at any time. Because it was I who made a decision in the first place, comes the same thing with God. He blessed us with life, and he is the author and the authority of life. Therefore, he can give and take away at any time he sees fit. And as it says in the, the chapter Job 121, as he said, Naked I came into the world in my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh so he is the authority. He created us just like giving us gifts. You can pay somebody over and over and over and you have, you don't have to, you didn't owe them anything, but you're doing it because you're nice because you stopped paying. doesn't mean what you did was bad. As long as you didn't promise you would do it. Exactly. I mean, so basically what you're saying is that it's okay for God, but it's not okay for humans to do it. like, that's that's what you, you are right along with my notes dude I swear, you are on point with it so that is actually so, one point so you're saying that genocide is okay for god to do but it's not okay for humans to do it is that what you're saying because the definition of genocide and murder is a human being killing another human being out of anger resentment greed or selfishness that's the definition of the word now god created human beings but he's not now god the son is but not god the father so how what can it fit the definition? The are they sinning? Who? Are, are the humans like committing the genocide? Are they sinning in the moment, but even though God's allowing it? So the point that he raised is because God sends the Israelites to judge other nations. Now, just like throughout the Bible, God uses prophets and other people to do his will. And that's just part of who God is. He loves us having that interaction with him to fulfill what his will is. And that's why he used the, the Israelite community to carry out his will of justice. Now, there's nothing morally wrong with that, because if you actually read in the, uh, the Old Testament of what these civil civilizations were doing, the horrendous, which I will bring up later, I'm not going to spoil it right now, but there are some horrendous acts they've been uh, doing for many, many, many years. And he has actually warned those people for over 400 years to change their ways. And they've even killed the prophets that were sent to them. So God had enough. And he uses the Israelite community to carry out his will and cast judgment onto that community. And I guess I can skip ahead a little bit. Nah, I won't. But I will answer your question a little bit later. Okay, so if, if God was true and heaven and hell exist, then people don't really die. They just change location. Also, if the person mentions God killing innocent children, that is straight up wrong. Because this point saying that they don't truly die so at this point by saying that if they don't truly die plus in scripture it says that children will go to heaven and now it is unclear of the age of accountability but when david saw um this is in uh second samuel 12 19 through 23 it says when david saw that his servants were whispering david perceived that the child was dead therefore david said to his servants is the child dead and they said yes he is dead 
So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and went to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and he requested to get some food, and they set it before him, and he ate. Then the servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive and ill, but now the child is dead. You arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? I can't bring him back again, but I shall go to him, not him return to me. So David is clearly saying that he will see his son again in heaven. So just because a, a child dies doesn't mean they're all automatically going sent to hell because God is just and he's not going to let anything unjust happen. Second uh, Samuel twelve nineteen through 23. Uh, I do like this passage uh, in general because it does show like there is a certain age of accountability, but the youngest ones, like the ones that are truly innocent, you know, they don't get sent to hell. Like David was so sure that he was going to see him in heaven. And... Uh, it just shows about, you know, God's grace and mercy, which is part of his character. And it's unjust to send somebody to hell on ignorance. You know, them not knowing because they're so young. That is completely unjust. And it's uncontradictory to God's character in general. So as we went through 2 Samuel 12 through 19, or 12, 19 through 23. So this verse clearly depicts that Davis's faith, knowing God, hasn't take, has taken his son into heaven to be with him. And he will see his son again. So the Lord is just and that his character is just. Justice flows from him. It would be very unjust to send a young child to hell based upon their ignorance of not knowing something or even having the capacity of obtaining knowledge in the first place. Some people say that God puts uh, the blood of Jesus on that child when they die. Some people say it comes naturally from God's grace and his character that he accepts them into heaven. So whichever route you take is both of them are true they could all both be in the same sense at the same time because of jesus blood shows his great grace and all that so it, it could be both third point is god's justice he cannot let evil go unpunished in the old testament as we read about how Pharaoh hardened his heart in the exodus of 823 doing so caused the plagues to happen and later you read that god hardened pharaoh's heart now, some people will start to blame God and say that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. But if you actually read Romans 121, which says this, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their own thoughts, and they were foolish, and their hearts were darkened. And Romans 121 says, Therefore God also gave them up to their uncleanliness in the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So this clearly depicts God is giving Pharaoh to his own folly. So first they harden their heart from themselves, and eventually God gives up and gives them over to their evil desires. So it it's still completely in line with the Old Testament and the New Testament of how God wants them to come to them for repentance, but if they turn away, they also harden their own hearts, and eventually God gives them over to that. So now, if they still go on a rant and continue to push the issue then it's not an intellectual issue, it is an emotional issue. When they keep saying that God is evil or it is wrong, then ask them what do they mean by that. Depending on the worldview, they might have no grounds to say why evil is evil or what is or isn't. That would be a shift in the topic. Now, the ball is in their court because they're going to have to explain why it would be evil for mass genocide in general if they do not believe that there is a God or a God exists. Any question so far yeah what if they say that there is a historical precedence right like genocide is evil based on world war ii for example oh, yeah i agree that you know the mass killing of humans but it's also because depending on the perspective of who it is if you're talking about the nazis how they start genocide yes that that is evil that is out of selfishness that is out of greed that is out of control that is their own militia but if the allies, you know, coming in to defend, to help keep, you know, the concentration camps to stop that atrocity, then that's justified because it's not allowing the innocents to get killed by evil. So it, it is justified. Mm -hmm. For example, the Bible says, some people always twist it in, in the, um, the Ten Commandments where it says, they always say, oh, it says you should not kill. You should not kill. No, it says you shall not murder is what it says. Now, killing is 
in the like within the context of preserving an innocent life is justified. For example, if you and I were in a McDonald's and we're you know trying to get some of that twenty piece chicken nugget meal, you know what I'm saying? And some guy comes in and starts spraying the crowd, and then I hit him high, you hit him low, and we end up killing him in the process. We did not commit murder. We're trying to preserve the innocent life, and he died in the process. So that's that's the difference between killing and murdering. Is that we're we're, used, we're justified no, through protection. What of you're life. saying. So what you're saying is that when God flooded the world, He was trying to preserve some sort of goodness within humanity. He was trying to strip the world of its evil to be correct. But did he regret it, flooding the world? So it wasn't well, regret, was but he made the promise of not doing it again. Because I mean, God, even though His character is My just, Lord. He still has compassion for every one of us, which is why. The shortest verse in the Bible was Jesus wept, which is, ooh, ooh, gives me chills every time. But it is something <laughs> that he cannot let go because because of love, you cannot let somebody constantly hurt somebody that you love. You got to put a stop to it. You can't just let bygones be bygones and let the person continue to hurt somebody that you, you daily care about. That's not love. That is the complete opposite. Yeah. So if you love somebody, you want to you want to protect them. You want, you know, not wrong done to them. And because God knows the outcome of just letting these civilizations do that, it's going to cause more hurt, more pain, and more death, and more innocent blood shed, and more people born into such corruption, causing more corrupted people. So that's why he had to put a stop to it. It's just like, it's like can't skin cancer, right? The dermatologists, when they cut out the skin, yes, you have clean cells being taken away from the cancerous cells, but in the long run, it's keeping the spread of cancer for the yeah, body. Also, there was this... This one verse, I think, I don't know where it was, but it's a uh, he who spares his fiddle does not love his children. So during sounds the flood, like Proverbs. he did not spare. Yeah, sounds a lot yeah, like Yeah, I think it's in Proverbs. It was Proverbs. I remember us reading it. But essentially, God does not spare his fiddle, uh, especially during the flood. Yeah, that's correct. So that would be like a good counter to that, you know, he who spares his fiddle does not love his children. So it doesn't make sense that God wouldn't do something about the evil that was already there before the flood. But... Yeah. And it also comes into play with if God knows every single outcome, who's to say that us being on like the third dimension can even grasp what the fourth dimension and how he operates is doing. It's like, uh, I'm meh at chess i dabble once in a while but it's like me going to a chess master game and it's like within a couple moves all of a sudden i'm like oh that move was terrible he just blew the whole game even though this man has more experience than i could ever achieve and he knows what he's doing it makes more sense that the guy made that move based on knowing what, what that move was going to do versus me looking on the outside in the point is, you know, God is in a different dimension. He sees past, present, future all in one glance. He knows every single outcome and the cause and effect of every single outcome. For us to say, oh, this was a bad move is ignorance and silliness, you know, of our three pound meat sack of a brain to understand the complexity of, of his will. As we continue, there are still, uh, to go, if they, yeah, as they say, they still go on a rant, like they said. That's when you start switching. So depending on their worldview, they might have no grounds of what to say, what is evil and what is good. So murder, when they say that mur God created murder in the Old Testament, murder is defined as a human being killing another out of anger, anger, selfishness, greed, or revenge. Considering God is the creator of all humans and does not make him a human being. Now God is... The Son, Jesus, is, but not God the Father. Now, God did not murder by the definition of murder. He judged the nations on their horrible acts of evil. Seen in Deuteronomy 12.31, which is why I brought order earlier, where we're going to see what these nations were doing around them. So it says, You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they have burned even their sons and daughters into the fire to their gods as an act of worship. God was punishing evil. If someone has an issue with them, you know, they were literally sacrificing their babies on metal altars, which is Moloch, for those who don't know their story, uh, which comes from the Canaanites, is horrible. Like, if you actually, there, there's some books and scholar and historian books that talk about these civilizations. 
They would have a bronze statue of a bull with outstretched hands and the fires would heat up the palms of those hands and they would have their children thrown onto the heating hands as they scream and the parents to drown out the baby scream, uh, the people around them would bang the drums so loud to drown out the child screaming. It's absolutely disgusting. And they'd done this. God was warning them for over 400 years to cut the crap or they're going to be judged and they ignored it. They killed the prophets. So eventually God had enough until the Israel nation to be like, all right, just take their land because he's also fulfilling the promise that they will occupy that area. And that was an area of what the air, you know, that he promised. So he's both fulfilling a promise and judging evil at the same time, which is a pattern because you notice that, you know, God's plan has multiple factors to it instead of just one. So God called the Israelites to judge their nation and defeating them in battle. Now, God isn't biased because we read later in Judges 2, 14 through 15, which states, In his anger against Israel, the Lord has given them to the hands of the raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies and all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Then, whenever Israel went out to the fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them as they have sworn to them. They were in great distress. So God wasn't just picking a group of people and says, I'll protect you at all costs. He does evil no matter what the context is, which is why you read in that chapter, the Israelites have also done evil. They abandoned the Lord and they went into their wicked ways. And God picked the nation to judge the Israelites, just as he used the Israelites to judge other nations. So this passage describes how God allowed Israel to be oppressed and defeated by their enemies as a form of judgment for their disobedience and their actions and idolatry. Throughout the history of Israel, there are several instances where God used foreign nations as an instrument of judgment to discipline his people and ultimately bringing them back to him for repentance. Last but not least, in the passages where we read that people will pull out of context and God sent the Israelites to kill men and women and children in the land of Canaan that were used to say that, oh, this is why God is evil, and but it shows that they did not read the rest of that book. Because a few chapters later in Judges 1, 27 through 36, it shows that the Canaanites were still around in other locations. Now, wait a minute. I thought it said they killed everybody from every woman, man, and child. So that means the text isn't really saying they killed every man, woman, and child, but they were showing their killing and winning of war through expressive hyperbole. There are many ancient texts that show this even today. When you even watch like ESPN reels, and they say this football team absolutely demolished this other team. Does that mean that the other team no longer exists? Of course not. It's hyperbole. So we've addressed many points of why, you know, God chooses to judge and is not genocide by the definition of our English words. And since he's the creator, he's the ultimate authority. Plus he's outside the dimension and knows what he's doing. And it helps also other people be drawn to him and become turn away from their wickedness and become better. So through all this, God interweaves his will and righteousness throughout human history to help us find the ultimate good, which is him. And if we will run into people, no matter how logical, no matter how much you express it, they will, they will literally throw this off a table and, and keep throwing that verse of like, Oh, you know, God did this and this. And they say it's wrong. Now, that's when, as I said, you switch tactics. So if, it, if a person that's atheist or someone that doesn't believe that God exists, or even within pantheism, universalism, and other things, they have no grounds to say what is objectively wrong. Even though they're, they express moral outrage on the incident, it is also contradicting to their worldview of saying that it's all arbitrary. And plus, they're also very angry about something that doesn't exist, which uh, is odd. It's like, you know, me getting upset and yelling at kids because they believe in Santa and getting mad at Santa, even though if I believe that Santa doesn't exist, it's like, why are you so morally outraged? Uh, what do you mean Santa doesn't exist? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. It was based off of the St. Nick. Right. So the last point before I close out the class would be if they do ignore this and stuff. It does show an emotional issue 
And you can either ask them, you know, it's like, I'm not going to project, but I think, have you been hurt by religious hypocrites before in your past? It usually roots down to it. So it is an emotional response, not a logical response. And that's when we start to dissect of the philosophical aspects of the issue of morality, of where it comes from, based upon their worldview. Because if there's no grounds, there's no morality, and it's all arbitrary, then they have no willingness to say why what God did was evil, because then that's just their opinion that it's evil, which falls through because you wouldn't be arguing over an opinion. That's just absurd and silly. And um, I believe it was Frank Turk that mentioned in his book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, where it says for atheists to make their argument of God being evil, they had to sit in God's lap to slap him in the face. What if they bring up an event like, say, the Crusades, right? Like, can you just chalk it down to the flaws of Catholicism? Or is there something more to it than that? Is it the same thing with the flood? It's a historic event. Yeah, Not there you go. So, yeah, it is a historical event. But that's when you ask them, okay, I know, uh, we know that I was wrong. But I would ask them, I'm like, hey, all right, will you please show me where in scripture does Jesus call for this and sometimes they will run because of the old testament where god chose to judge the nations and stuff and that's where it's like okay yes but they a lot of people can say god told me to do this and i'll give an example like if i just walked up to you and slapped you across the face and said god told me to do it would you buy it no no exactly so jesus never called for that he called to well, love others really who care for you well, you don't deserve a slap. <laughs> Pearly makes a good point. Like, you know, you have the Spanish Inquisition. You have the Salem Witch Trials. You have the Crusades. You have even slavery in the United States where there were Christian homes that brought their slaves to church and then later on in the week beat them almost to the brink of death. So it's like, yeah, it tells you nothing what scripture says. It tells you a lot about that person or people. Because, But also notice that each of those events were the state taking like action in religion or in our faith i should say the state taking control crusades the state taking control uh the salem witch trials the, the state or the government taking control you know it's it's not our faith is a personal faith it shouldn't be dictated by the state and when it does you get things like the crusades you get things like the witch trials you get things like the spanish inquisition correct uh, there was also a lot of the church encouraging it in some places then there was also disagreement within the church as well it's kind of a big old mixed bag of motivations not good motivations it. but just a big mat mixed bag yeah I, I will also point out this too if the actions of a person even though they claim a title determines what their religion is about, then they should have no issue when I say, all I need to know about Islam is 9-11. That is extremely biased, that is extremely bigoted and narrow-minded. You know, I should have the intellectual yeah. honesty to actually look in the Quran and says, hey, does it call for this kind of extremism or not? Or are those people just misguided, misrepresented it, and use their religion to justify evil acts? Uh, yes, Doran. You had your hand up for a while. I had a quick thought, and I'll get to you, GG, in the back in a second. Having some research being conducted, what if somebody were to say that the scriptures are not really the word of God, and they would say that the Bible is false because it's been written over the years by people? What about that argument? Okay, I would say bring evidence to the, the table that shows that it has been changed. Because I can bring counter yeah, evidence that is. That. Even if someone were to say that, couldn't we just argue that even to this day, the Bible is still fulfilling itself? Well, yeah, that's one of the points. Is but I would also argue, like the New Testament alone, this just the Gospels have over about six thousand Greek manuscripts and pieces of Greek manuscript that all agree to an infinitesimal degree, and the earliest one is dated between forty to sixty A.D predating anything that that world has to offer at the time also outgrowing plato herodotus socrates caesar and all the people around that time it blows them out of water and the earliest one i think next to the bible or the gospels manuscripts are oh i think it was herodotus 
and he has like 375 and we have over 6,000. So we have 20 manuscripts to their one manuscript. So the fact that we have multiple manuscripts, even though we don't have the originals, which I would argue by saying, if you only had the originals would cause more room for confusion because you don't know if those were the true originals or if they're only copies that got, you know, someone could made the original original and then someone could have raced those and rewritten those the way they wanted it and say that those were original and then save those. And then it's like, you know, right off the bat, it could have been misrepresented versus multiple manuscripts that all agree infinitesimally throughout many years show from point A to point Z that there was no change whatsoever through the past 2000 years. That's more reliable than just having one manuscript. You said that there would be some evidence in the whole altering the Bible thing. And I immediately thought about the alterations King James did to the Bible. Like, I think there was one example where he, I think, removed the word tyrant and replaced it with terrible. What do you have to say about that? I don't know where you're referencing that in the King. Like, it's the whole Bible. There's like a million words. Where... Where that happened. Thankfully, I don't think we're uh, King James only over here. Like, there are manuscript variants, but it's such a minuscule difference. Like you said, there are some words that use a bigger definition of a word or a smaller definition. Or versus, like, Jesus Christ to Christ Jesus. And it's like, it's the okay. most mini The message does not change just because the word, the definition... Well, not the definition of the word changes, but, the like, how they use a different word doesn't change the message whatsoever like it's still the same plus well, no, if I mean, someone uh, does change it you can notice the change because of the manuscript evidence like you can go back to the greek yeah, manuscripts and be I like think... oh look you added that that doesn't belong there and it's easy to just disband it as uh, being a forgery i mean the thing that i wanted to hint at is that uh, i remember there was a video that was talking about it and essentially what it was hinting at is that king james was writing it with the agenda of protecting his um his royalty right which could damage the message of the bible in theory well we don't go we don't copy off the king james version we go off the greek manuscripts that's the okay, difference so that's like okay okay so, it's not yeah, like king one james copy of the bible the and then that copy english. of the bible gets another copy and then that copy of that older esv copy gets a copy of the N no we still have the greek people and greek is actually there's even colleges throughout universities and stuff that still study Greek. It's very open. You can study it for yourself. It's going to take like five years, but you can, <laughs> you can yeah, do you it. You can even get yourself an interlinear Bible that has... Right. Like, you know, like and they have Greek all Greek these Hebrew manuscripts. And get yourself a, you know, an Eng or Hebrew to English and Greek to English lexicon. So I will close in prayer. <laughs> um, but if you guys want to continue the questions and stuff, I'll, I'll hang around. Oh, um.